Hello. My name is Dick Cavett, and this program is called The Dick Cavett Show. It's a regularly scheduled program, which usually features a band and an audience and entertainment and comedy and so forth. And today, of course, it is not. We find ourselves, uh, once again, in the moral, political, psychological, emotional aftermath of the latest in America's series of political assassinations, uh, the death of Robert Kennedy. And today we will talk about that and related subjects. All of our guests are not here yet, but four of them are, and I'd like you to meet them. First, Mr. Robert Vaughn, whom you know as an actor, and probably as a man active in liberal democratic policies, a close friend of the Kennedys. Mr. Roy Wilkins, executive director of the NAACP, and Dr. David Abrahamson, psychiatrist, author, author of a pamphlet or book or study entitled A Study of Lee Harvey Oswald's Psychological Capability of Murder, and Mr. David Schoenbrunn, who is former chief Washington correspondent for CBS during the Kennedy administration. He's now professor at Columbia, guest commentator, I believe, at ABC. Later, we will be joined by Lauren Bacall and F. Lee Bailey, all things permitting. Now, Mr. Schoenbrunn, you're a teacher. Where, how shall we start? Well, I think probably with uh, educating ourselves and the public as to where we really stand. This is a day when I suppose we're all tempted. We're all tempted to great exaggerations. There are those who are going to say America is a totally sick society. And those like Governor Reagan early this morning who said that everything is fine and all we need is law and order. And of course, they're both right and they're both wrong. America is certainly very sick. What we've all been living through for years with the assassinations of Medgar Evers and Malcolm X and Martin Luther King, John F. Kennedy, Robert Kennedy is certainly a symptom of a sick society. When one realizes that there were last year in our country more than 5,000 cases of violence uh, with guns involved, whereas in England there were 16 and in France there were 12, mm -hmm. there's something wrong. But we're also, of course, a healthy society. I, I suppose I could describe our country as many friends we all have as a man who is very healthy, handsome, successful, drinking too much, gambling, playing around. What's wrong with our country is not its basic health, but its way of life. And I think we must address ourselves to our way of life and where we stand today, for I cannot and will not believe that this was simply an accidental incident of one demented man. The coincidence is too strong. It's part of the climate of violence in which we have been living for too long. Yes, you wonder how long we can go on saying this is an isolated incident, and two weeks later we have another isolated incident. Well, it's not. I remember Germany in the 20s and 30s. Rathenau was killed. There were seven assassinations of German democratic politicians, violence in the streets, and then we ended up with Hitler. Mr. Vaughan, what are your thoughts? Well, I subscribe to what Mr. Schoenbrunn has just said, that it is part of both concepts that there is a healthy America somewhere beneath the drunken and violent America. It's still extant there. I hope, I hope it will find its course again with some new leadership and some new thoughts and some new thinking that will manifest themselves in trying to reason out the problems of the world domestically and internationally, not by force, but by sensitivity and awareness and gentleness. It seems that the gentleman that Mr. Schoenbrunn mentioned, who have fallen under the assassin's gun, Adlai Stevenson, who was attacked viciously just before Dallas, seemed to have been the object of the conservative point of view. And I would hate to label or categorize all of these situations, and some of them are still dubious. Martin Luther King, case in point, as being simply the manifestations of homicidal drives of the extreme right, but it seems to be clearer 
with each subsequent assassination that it, there is evidence in that area. Mr. Wilkinson, Wilkins, sir, what will this do now in terms of civil rights movement and the people who, the Negro people who were so passionately fond of the late Senator Kennedy, where will that passion direct itself now? Of course, a great many of them were passionately fond of Senator Kennedy, as you have uh, indicated. And uh, many uh, voted for him in the primary, and many worked for him in his campaign. I think this stemmed uh, basically from Senator Kennedy's espousal of a kind of government that cared about the people lowest down and the people who were under certain handicaps, uh, like uh, the deprived minorities, victims of prejudice and, and economic uh, sleight of hand uh, dealings. I think uh, a part of it stemmed also from very concrete evidence that the senator gave while he was attorney general that he believed, as far as his office was concerned, that it was a function of government to actively, affirmatively uh, take part in, in uh, guaranteeing the rights and the protections which uh, citizens uh, under our form of government were deemed um, eligible to enjoy. Uh, this was not lost on the Negro community in the United States. And it persisted uh, even after the tragic assassination of his brother, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, sort of thing attached to him. Where will we go from here? I don't know. It's um, the only safe prediction is that the movement for decency and for a greater share in government by those, a greater concern of government for those uh, who are deprived and the continuing crusade for vindication of minority freedoms, uh, along with other freedoms, uh, freedom of other groups in our country, will continue. Uh, assassinations haven't stopped it in the past. Uh, wars haven't stopped it. Uh, excessive, repressive economic uh, stoppages haven't checked it. Uh, somehow or other, we have persisted. And I look for that to uh, take place now, even in the face of this latest uh, and most appalling uh, killing of Senator Kennedy. Do you think there's a sense now among Negro people of desire for revenge once again, as there was after the death of Dr. King? Some I haven't detected any of it so far. Of course, those are latent. Uh, desires uh, that manifest themselves sometime after the initial tension has worn off or the initial shock. But I haven't detected any. They regard uh, the senator's death as the loss of a great friend, uh, a man in the councils of the mighty who spoke for them. And I don't think there would be a disposition uh, to uh, initiate a series of disorders in his behalf or, or to recover some imagined lost ground, especially in, in the light of the fact that, that the suspect uh, now being held is alleged to be a, a, uh, of an origin outside of this country and not particularly identified with the deprivations of the Negro minority in this country. Mr. Kevin, yes. may I intervene here for a second? It seems to me that um, the Negroes have demonstrated that they are not motivated by revenge. They are the most patient people that I've ever seen. I doubt that I myself, if I were black, would have been as patient as some of our black fellow Americans have been. However, as these things accumulate, I think that we all must determine, all of us of every color, that the things that men like Kennedy and King stood for not die with them. And uh, we have seen that nothing has been done since Kennedy's death, John F., since uh, the death of Dr. King. The current commission has been filed in a drawer. 
Now, I really think the time has come for every single American citizen to make sure that the assassin's bullet doesn't shoot down with the man the thing that the man stood for and that we all must stand for if our nation is going to survive. Uh, <coughs> I would like to agree with very much of what you have said, Mr. Sherbrooke, also because that you are a very knowledgeable person. Uh, you mentioned here something about the, that the, uh, you, you don't think really that the American society is sick or some, some words to that effect. Well, I'm sorry to disagree with you. I think that there is a great deal of emotional and social sickness in American culture. And before we even can think of stopping violence, we really have to look for the causes for it. You know, I mean, just like a medical doctor tries to help a patient, he has to examine him first and see what kind of symptoms does he represent, what uh, kind of help can we give him? And when I look at the American scene, uh, there is no doubt about that we have had violence since uh, early times. Uh, the, of course, this, uh, and nobody really likes to know that the first man who was hanged in the United States was in 1630. His name was Billinger, and he was a passenger of the uh, admired Mayflower passengers, Mayflower ship. And we have been having all this violence going on time and time and again. Now, uh, having studied a little about the human mind, if I may say so, and also particularly the American scene, uh, there is most definitely, a, so we are dealing with a society which harbors a great deal of frustrations. And these frustrations here, in contrast to many other countries, are much more prevalent than in any other society, for one reason only. This, our America, is the most affluent country there is in the world. If you uh, can find your way around here, you can do everything what you please almost. That means that you can get money and you can get power. And for this money and for this power, everyone is striving for, because the opportunity is here. The only question is how to get it. Well, of course, Many people don't get it, and so they are frustrated. This goes not only to the Negro, but to the average uh, white person, or to uh, the Indian, or whoever it is. And these frustrations in the United States, I think, are much more prevalent than in any other, in any other society. But remember also that we are a practical people, but this, besides this also, we have a great many fantasies. We have created this country from scratch in the course of 300 years. We have not only built a country, but we have rebuilt and built a continent consisting of all kinds of things and made this into a livable continent. But in doing this, we have stretched ourselves so far that, and we thought in our uh, omnipotence that we could do everything and we can't do everything. We have not been able to see our limitations. Uh, I don't want to say to sound in any way moralistic and so on. But uh, I read some time ago the Kerner report. And the president, with all due respect to him, haven't said one word. There are no recommendations about it. And yet this is a burning question, a burning thing which should have been done at once. And instead, as you very correctly said, Mr. Schoenbrunn, it has been put in a file. I was surprised to find in that Kerner uh, 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 book, may I please continue? Mm -hmm. Uh, that, for instance, uh, unless we stop, uh, the, this society is moving to two societies. Well, I'm sorry that the current people there must have been sleeping all their life because we are two societies. We are a black society and we are a white society. And the Negroes have not been permitted to participate in American life. They are not, have not been per permitted to participate in, uh, in the mainstream of American life. And I think the reason is very simple. Although it sounds very simple, I hope you f forgive me for my being simple today. Uh, it is really a question of power. And this goes for the individual, it goes for the class. Remember one thing here. We don't have many traditions in the United States. The only th tradition we have really is money and power. And it is around that everything circles. There is no class, no tradition. And because of this, the, our society is exceedingly unstable. There is no stability. Where shall you then turn to? Every individual feels insecure and fearful. And with fear comes hate. 
and with hate comes some violence. Viol violence. And it's because of this, uh, I think that we have all these uh, horrible uh, killings and murder. And by the way, if you don't mind, uh, Mr. Schönbrunn, I must say this to you that in all friendliness that there were killed last year in America 12,000 people, 12,000 people, uh, which is over, uh, which is 10 times as many as in England, not to speak about in Scandinavia. And one reason for all this killing is, as you certainly know, and I think you pointed this out, is that possibly 60 to 70 percent of all our killing is done with a gun. Now look here, for instance, with regard to the National Rifle Association. They are against, they are against uh, uh, licensing because it might infringe upon them. We are living today in 1968 in a country, and we should now have stopped these pioneering days and these frontiers. But still, we linger on. We live in the, in the dreams of the Wild West, that everyone can be a big man. And with, oh, with all this came these uh, frustrations and these fears leading to hate and violence. And so, before we can do anything, it is very good to have wishes. It is very good to sit down on such a very sad day today. It is. And I'm sure that all of you have been up late this morning, early this morning and early yesterday, and we are all confronted with a horrible situation, with a horrible assassination again. And we really should, as you said very correctly, try to sit down there. But really, we have to look for the causes before we can begin any remedies. I'm sorry that it have taken such a long time. It's all right. Simone, I know you're concerned very much with our foreign policy, and I've heard you speak about it on other programs. And we've been told in the last couple of days by some of the uh, in the last 24 hours by some of the national figures who have said, in effect, we are not so guilty. We've also been told that it's meaningless to make a parallel between a nation's foreign policy and individual acts of violence within our country. Is it so meaningless a parallel? Is well, it may not be a black and white parallel, but it is certainly not meaningless. I am certain that this monstrosity that we have been involved in in Southeast Asia for four years, five years, 12 years, would not have occurred had those men been of white skin. I'm quite certain that the entire concept of alienation from society that produces, if that was the man Oswald, if Saran, Saran was the man, the Eric Fromm, Hannah Arendt, Eric Hoffer concept of true believer in relation to not being able to identify with self and therefore finding causes uh, that will produce an individual case and place in history can be related very often to the, to the racist or to the individual himself, to the physical individual, the assassins have been deeply disturbed people in the past. They have often been small. I, I'm getting into your area, Doctor. It's all right. They have often been small. They have felt alienated from society. Oswald felt alienated from the America that was affluent. Sirhan Sirhan felt alienated, from what we can gather to date, also from the America that was affluent, and also from uh, great feelings of sympathy toward communism in Russia and China. I think that it is not meaningless. I think that there are very close parallels. I do not think that the war that Mr. Schoenbrunn and I have spoken against for many years would have gone on over this incredible number of years had it been a war between Americans and Canadians, Americans and white-skinned, blue-eyed Germans. But we look at Vietnam and they are little people, and they are not the leaders of the world. They are not the white men of the world who we believe have the right and responsibility for leadership in the world. So I think there is a parallel, if not complete, certainly significant. I think that there's another parallel, if I may say so, and it's a very painful thing for any citizen to have to contemplate. We all, we all want to admire our president, who is the symbol of leadership of our nation. But I must say that I felt for a long time that one of the most violent men in the world is the president of the United States. 
and that when I listened to Mr. Johnson last night talking against violence, this man who has committed such terrible violence against the quite innocent people of Vietnam, who is running a war where I myself have watched villages being destroyed in the name of saving them, when we have killed uh, and wounded uh, some two million people and made refugees out of another two million, that's one out of every four people in the entire nation has been killed, wounded, or had his home taken away from him, that the president comes to the discussion of violence with hands that are not completely clean. It's, a, it's an awful thing to say, but I started out this morning by saying what we have to do in this moment of truth is to try to educate ourselves. And I know my own students at Columbia University used to say that to me. They want us to go and kill in Vietnam, and they get upset when we protest here on, on the campus. There's a difference between, and I'm sure Dr. Abramson would agree with me, there's a difference between violence against things, which is what our students do, and violence against life, which is what our government does. So in that sense, foreign policy is very much a reflection of and tied to the violence in American life.